Our brains are so complicated, neuroscientists are still only at the beginning of understanding how that gray matter inside our skull works. For centuries, the brain was completely misunderstood. Then, as we started to unlock the myriad regions and elements of the brain, a wide range of theories emerged about how it worked. Most of those have been set aside, especially since the introduction of functional magnetic resonance imaging to map our brains. Over the past 25 years, fMRIs have reshaped our understanding of the brain. One important discovery has been how flexible and adaptable it is. Dr. Norman Deutsch has been at the forefront of discovering the power of the brain to adapt and change because of its plastic nature. Neuroplasticity, in other words, is the ability to form and reorganize synaptic connections in response to learning, experience, disease, and following injury. We asked Dr. Deutsch to join us for a conversation that matters about our remarkably adaptable brains. Conversations That Matter is a partner program for the Centre for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Dr. Deutsch, welcome to Conversations That Matter. Thanks for having me. Let's start with just a brief definition of what neuroplasticity sure. is and then we'll go from there and how we can apply it to our lives. Sure, it's the property of the brain that allows it to change its structure, its physical structure and its function in response to mental experience. And mental experience can be perceiving, sensing, thinking, imagining, moving, any of those things insofar as they create a subjective mental experience actually changes the structure of the brain. It changes the connections between the cells. Mm -hmm. uh, physical exercise can trigger all sorts of growth factors that allow certain parts of the brain, in fact, to grow new cells and so on. So it's, it's a big change from this old machine model mm -hmm. that saw the brain as hardwired since birth and it has huge cultural and clinical implications. You talk about the neurons that fire together, wire together. So I learn how to do something and I start to create this uh, neural pathway, then all these different elements start to line up and it becomes this pattern. Um, and this is the way that we learn. By understanding that neuroplasticity is available, does it give us hope and encouragement that we can change the way that, we, that we've been doing things, especially if it's something that uh, has not been producing positive results? Uh, emphatically, yes. I, you know, one way to think about plasticity is, um, you know, when neurons fire uh, in, in a repeated pattern and, and they learn something, they fire faster, stronger signals. So you, your brain gets better at doing whatever you choose to do. Mm -hmm. So if you choose well, um, it's going to get better at that. It's sort of like snow on a hill in winter. Yeah. If you want to do something for the first time and it's a virgin hill, you can ski down that pliable snow Take, and take many different paths. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go down that hill and you had a good run, being human, you might want to do that run again and mm -hmm. again and again. And then what will happen is uh, you'll get better at doing that run. You'll get tracks in the snow. Mm -hmm. You keep it up, you can get ruts in the snow to the point that those neurons that are doing that activity are, are so fast, so good at it, that it's hard to do it a different way. Mm -hmm. So. Plasticity also contributes to habits, bad and good. Mm -hmm. um, and so yes, you can sculpt your brain by the choices you make. So then how do you unwind that if this has been, you know, there's a stimulus and a response that your brain has recognized, this happens, this is the way that you've taught me that you want me to respond. How do you then start to change that? Well, you have to, you have to block it in some way. And you know, one of the ways that this came to light and um, in, in a story that teaches many lessons has to do with the work of Edward Taub who actually worked with stroke patients. Mm -hmm. uh, early on he made some really important discoveries. So if you, if you know someone who's had a stroke, they're often told that they should have physiotherapy for about six weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what insurance companies will offer, often cover. And that's because about a hundred years ago, it was discovered that after a stroke, you know, there might be a clot in the brain or bleeding, but there has to be a lot of chemical work in the brain to, f to deal with that. 
And even if the stroke is very local in a certain part of the brain, there's kind of a global non-functioning immediately after the stroke in this period of crisis. And what we now know is that if you try to use your arm, let's say there was a stroke here and it blocked the use of this arm. Mm -hmm. If you try to use that arm uh, and over and over and it doesn't work, you will learn it doesn't work. And the circuit for that arm will actually enter a state of dormancy. And it basically turns that circuit down. It's already damaged, but it kind of turns the whole circuit off completely. Mm -hmm. What you'll probably try to do is use your good hand. And because you're not using this hand, the plastic brain is a use it or lose it brain. So mm -hmm. whatever potential that existed in this circuit now starts to atrophy or fade away. And if you're using this hand, which is this part of the brain, this will get stronger. So what Edward Taub did is he realized that this is actually a problem relying on just the good hand because you're further weakening um, the damaged hand, if mm -hmm. you will. So he would put this hand in a cast or a sling and he would then force the person to train, retrain the use of this arm, almost like they were a child learning to use child's toys up. Mm -hmm. And he actually found that he could get function back by doing that. So this is re really important. You've got to block right. the habit. Um, and sometimes you use something almost artificial to block it. Well, and that's because the, it's not, actually not the hand that's damaged. It's right. the part of the brain that, that sends the signals to the hand to be used. Right, and this learned non-use over the years as, I, uh, as I've been in this game for a while, I realized that learned non-use exists not just in strokes, but it exists in multiple sclerosis, in Parkinson's, in, in, in lots of human con brain conditions, neurological and even psychiatric. It's a core sort of protection of the brain when something's not working to say, okay, let's use our resources um, where they, they'll be of benefit to me. Mm -hmm and to turn those circuits off. And just knowing that means you, if a person can't do something, you don't, if they can't do something now, you don't assume there's no function there. Mm -hmm. It may just be turned off. And that, that was one of the most important insights um, f for me yeah. that allowed me to realize that a lot of people who look like they're incurable might actually be helped. So, you know, when I was a, a <laughs> medical student, if let's say someone couldn't had a stroke and they lost 90% of function. The assumption was, you know, you'd go to some kind of x-ray or brain scan and you would see a lesion and you'd just say, oh yes, that's responsible for it. 90% of the cells governing the use of this hand must be dead. But it turns out that's often not the case. What you, what you very frequently have is what I call the noisy brain. Mm -hmm. So some cells die, that's true and there's nothing you can do about them. Yeah. Some cells are sick, they're metabolically compromised. They're in an area adjacent to the sick cells. So what you often have is the following. The cells that were adjacent to the dead cells that were, that were getting signals from it, some of them are suddenly bereft of signals, mm -hmm. and I think they go dormant. Others that are near the sick cells, uh, near the dead cells are still sick, and they're firing, but they're not firing at normal rates. They may be firing too slow. We know this from brain injury. We know this from lots of different studies. Mm -hmm. um, or firing irregularly. Think of a heart that has an arrhythmia. Mm -hmm. So they're sending junk data now to healthy cells. Mm -hmm. And the healthy cells are not getting good input. But if you think about it, it may be only a small percentage of the cells that are damaged in a person who's lost 90% of function. So if we can resynchronize mm. yep. those healthy cells, which we can, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, if we can resynchronize the sick cells, and there are many ways to do that. Sometimes mm -hmm. functional medicine can help you do that. We can find ways of getting um, the nutrients and, or the oxygen to those cells. Hyperbaric oxygen was, is one way, but there are many, many different ways to do it. And we can also set up um, a neurofeedback setup where we actually train the brain to refire at different rates. And there, there's many ways of doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, we can get function back um, much more quickly than we might imagine once we quiet the noise in the brain. Let's say somebody lost the use of a, their middle finger, it was amputated. And if you take a look at the brain map of the index finger and the ring finger and so on, and you can see that they will then start to move in and take over that space that was previously occupied by the brain map. In, in essence, they're squeezing it out because it's not being used. Yes, like there are people who are born with webbed fingers. Mm -hmm. And when now that we can map them um, in different ways, but if you do a brain map of a person with a webbed hand, 
there's just one map for the whole for the whole all hand. four fingers uh -huh. because they're always used at the same time and so neurons that fire together wire together so mm -hmm. there's just actually one map and there's a procedure for people who are born with this these kind of web fingers that separates the fingers so that they can use them independently. Mm -hmm. And six weeks later, if you remap their brains, they will have discrete air areas in their brain maps for each of those fingers. You know, you talk about that person who's had the stroke, and there has actually been some physical damage in their brain. In, the, in those initial weeks when they're recovering from that, it's going to be difficult for them to be sending out a signal to the to the damaged motor uh, neurons. Yeah. Within At what weeks. point can within, you Within, yeah, within yeah. weeks, we start, if there's absolutely no input, we start to see changes. There was an experiment done by um, a colleague of mine, Avero Pasqualioni, who's a remarkable man. And at one point, uh, he took people, uh, this was an experiment I think he did, as I recall, in Spain. And he, he gave them masks that gave them absolute blind, blindness. They couldn't see anything. And within, uh, I think it was like 24 to 48 hours, the occipital lobe, which is where the visual cortex mm -hmm. is, so that's the part of the brain that really processes vision, because it had no input whatsoever, was now processing sound and touch. And not only was it... Were the, the occipital lobe changed its function? Yes, it changed its function. Oh it completely. Gosh. And, you know, we, yeah. we've kind of sensed this. I mean, you know, there have been, you know, literary stories of, of blind people like, I don't know, like Homer and Milton and remarkable memories sometimes in these poets. And, and so there is a kind of reassignment that, mm -hmm. that can happen very, very quickly for um, a life-sustaining activity. And we know that people who uh, are blind, I have a friend who, who's blind, and now she l listens to audiobooks. Mm -hmm. uh, well, she could listen to audiobooks before she was blind, but she can listen to them so fast, I can't make out a single word. And she went through, you know, all the great Russian authors and the great French authors and the great English authors, and you wouldn't be able to make out a word. She turns that machine up so fast. Because She's listening she, to it in fast forward. Yeah, fast, yeah. fast, fast forward. I mean, you can't even make out the words, but she has all of this, you know, this huge part of her brain now, you know, this, this huge server <laughs> that is devoted to, plus her original auditory cortex, which has been mm -hmm. recommitted to this new task. In your book, The Brain's Way of Healing, you start to say, now here's how we can start to use that ability to start to deal with chronic pain. Do you, you know, as we start to use this as a way of dealing with chronic pain, because we've got a, a problem in North America, we deal with chronic pain an awful lot with prescription drugs and, yeah. and opioids. That's all about uh, plasticity, um, if, I, if I could just say. So, I mean, the reason people get addicted to opioids is the following. When the, these drugs were developed, first, first of all, we had sort of short-term morphine-like drugs. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the drug companies said, well, look, these people are in terrible pain. Let's say people with terminal cancer and so on and so forth. Maybe we can make a long-acting drug. And in those days, the model was very much a machine-like model again. It was like a lock and key model. Uh, in general, what happens is there's a cell and it's got a receptor site. And if you can get uh, a morphine-like substance onto the cell, um, you can turn off pain. Mm -hmm. But the idea was it was like, the chemical was like the key that fit into the lock, which was the receptor on the cell. And that if it was a machine, the idea would be just bombard, bombard it with enough morphine-like substance and the pain will go away. That's a pre-neuroplastic model of the brain. But yes. what really happens is the brain adapts to everything. So the brain is, is saying, boy, oh boy, there's a lot of morphine-like substance around here. I better not be overly sensitive to it. And it, it basically kind of down-regulates and gets less sensitive. At that point, you notice that your opioids aren't working as well as they were before. And so you up the dose. Mm -hmm. And you crave it more. And so that's how you get into an addictive cycle. It's the neuroplastic brain adapting to this exogenous external substance. I also, I'm fascinated by the concept of exercise and how important it is in our overall well-being, but particularly in our cognitive well-being. Mm -hmm. And you devote a chapter to that. Why, why is exercise so fundamentally important to all of us? Well, 
I mean, for, for starters, why did we develop brains? One of the reasons we need brains is because we live in a changing world. Mm -hmm. And we are very mobile creatures, and so we walk into change. We walk from our explored environment that we, we know into an unexplored environment. And so we have to, we're gonna have to learn. And you know, one of the things they discovered, uh, this was just with you know, experiments with rats and mice, is that if you put them on running whales, this was some of the early neuroplasticity experiments, the, their brains get a bigger volume and they actually grow new cells in mm -hmm. their hippocampi, um, which is the part of the brain that deals with short-term memory. And uh, this was proposed by Rusty Gage, who was one of the co-discoverers of the neuronal stem cell. Uh, that this is what he called anticipatory proliferation. So let's say you have something like a rat or a mouse and there's a new predator in the environment or there's no food left mm -hmm. and they have to leave. Uh, let's say it's a predator. They, they have to go pretty far. They're leaving their explored territory and they're going to an unexplored territory. So it's as though when we start going on really long walks or using our limbs a lot, it's clear we're going to have to be doing a lot of learning. Mm -hmm. And so we, we create these new cells. They proliferate in our brains, uh, in, our, in our hippocampi, so that we'll be able to do that short-term learning. So that's at least one of the reasons why I mm -hmm. think there's an association between uh, movement and, and learning. But it, it could even be deeper. I mean, to some extent, mm -hmm. the effects of exercise you know, it's not just that you get new, new cells in your hippocampus. Uh, you, you, many, many things happen, and there are, there are brain, growth, uh, brain growth factors. There's a brain-derived neurotrophic factor, right. which consolidates connections between cells. There's something called glial-derived neurotrophic factor, which um, is for the, the infrastructure, and perhaps even more than that in the brain. These glial mm -hmm. cells also communicate, but they also, um, do give all the support systems for the neurons in the brain. So this is triggered by exercise too. Mm -hmm. And I mean, pl plenty of studies now show right. uh, that exercise, um, if you exercise it uh, it's, and do a few other things, you lower your risk for Alzheimer's. Th this is a big deal. This is a big deal. It's a really big deal. Like there's so much to cover here. And one of the things that I think must be challenging for you is that you can't come and say there's a one-size-fits-all here because every single brain is different. Mm -hmm. Every life experience is different. The way that you think, the way that you've interacted with the world and so on affects how you're going to respond to the, to the change uh, and what put you in that particular position. But it appears to me that this is a tool that anybody can use to address challenges that they're having with their own life in so many different ways, mm -hmm. emotionally, psychologically, um, you know, physically, of course, and then dealing with uh, a, a wide variety of uh, motor challenges and, uh, and, and even ability to think. Uh, it must be very exciting for you that you're constantly discovering new ways to apply this. Yeah, it, well, I'm like that confused horseman riding off in all directions sometimes. Let's say there's somebody watching the show going, okay, I, you know, how do I start to apply this to my life? Where does somebody get started from your perspective? Um, does well, it just start with thought? I, I think that you know, there's one of, the, one of the sort of sad legacies of the, this machine model of the brain has been, it, it was also fused with a kind of simplistic genetic determinism so that people thought that, you know, I, I I, you know, I, I, I'm a, I've come out of the box like a computer and I've got certain specs and that's all that there is to that, to it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a really problematic idea. And you know, there are psychologists who've talked about a growth mindset and uh, a non-growth mindset. And that model produces a non-growth mindset. Mm -hmm. And you know, even things like IQ can be raised. Uh, I've now seen this a number of times. So there, there's just so many developments that a person can do. And so you've just got to just discard that machine model. You are mm -hmm. not a machine. It's, it's, uh, it's still a popular model among many neuroscientists. They like to think, right. I mean, at the very beginning of modern science, you know, Descartes described the, the physical brain as a hydraulic machine. And he thought that there were, 
the nerves were like vessels and currents moved up and down them. And he was a very smart person and he was trying to deal with something complicated. Um, and these hydraulic machines, when he wrote, were impressive at the time. And from that we got a notion of currents. And of course the currents aren't fluid or gas. They're, they're, not, they're not the kind of stuff he thought they were, but there are currents. Then when electrical machines came along, we stopped, started to talk about brains as having circuits. And there's something to that. We mm -hmm. talk about that still, but brain circuits are not just electrical, they're electrochemical. That's not quite right. And now that computers are everywhere, people in, in artificial intelligence frequently talk about thought as though it's software and the, and the computer as though it's hardware. And that's not right because Brains don't in function you, that way. the software yeah. rewrites and changes the hardware. And yeah. that's, that's pretty significant. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't change it infinitely. Mm -hmm. You know, this isn't about magic, this is about science and, you know, the kinds of improvements I write about in multiple sclerosis, traumatic brain injury, learning disorders, stroke, psychological problems, autism, mm -hmm. um, they're not magic. I'm trying to explain how they're possible. They might feel like magic if, you've, if you're stuck in that machine model, mm -hmm. but that's what has to be modified or discarded. It's, it's it really, it has to be understood uh, as a simile, sometimes the brain is machine-like, but not as a metaphor. It is not a machine. Right, and one of the other things that I note is, yes, you can think it, uh, you can uh, make changes internally, but at times you need external input as well yes. to be able to change the way in which your brain is interacting with the world. Um, and sure. so it's, we've, got, we've still got a long way to go. We're still early days, but there are continue to be so many new discoveries in the way in which we can apply neuroplasticity to our own well-being. It, it, it challenges conventional wisdom and I applaud you and thank you for bringing it to our attention. Uh, this is fascinating. We're way over time already but I want to thank you for thank you. coming in and doing this. Thank, thank you. you.